So what even is Mass Effect? That's not the actual point of this video, but it is a solid question to start with. It is fundamentally the one difference between this world and, well, I guess our own world. Mass Effect is basically the one reason everything in this universe is possible. But it didn't start with it, no it didn't. It all started with Element Zero. Element Zero, also called Ezo, is a material created when solid matter is affected by the energy of a star going supernova. This is the type of element you would find in wayward asteroids that float around neutron stars. Remnants of old massive stars that went boom, but were not big enough to form into black holes. Suffice to say, the material is exceedingly rare. But with it, virtually everything cool in this universe can be created. When element zero is subjected to an electrical current, it releases dark energy in a way that allows you to twist and manipulate the mass of matter. If you wanted to, for example, increase the mass of an object, you would pass a positive current through the element. If you wanted to decrease the matter of the object, you would pass a negative current through the element. They call it a mass effect field, which is where the name of the game comes from. This mass effect field is used in everything from artificial gravity to manufacturing to even allowing for faster than light speed. See, normally it is believed that traveling faster than the speed of light is impossible because for an object to attain such speeds, they must have close to or literally have no mass. Of course, normally it would be impossible to have a ship with no mass. The mass effect created by element zero virtually eliminates this problem by shrinking the mass of any object. Utilizing this technology on ship drives has allowed the races of this universe to attain faster than light speeds without causing time dilation. That is, without distorting the rules of time and space. Not quite the point of this video, but I figured I would let you guys know that this is also one of the reasons biotics exist in this world. See, you can manipulate dark matter with element zero as long as you can produce positive and negative electrical currents, something that our brain can very much do since, of course, our own bodies work through electricity. Babies that are affected by the dust form of element zero can actually sometimes create nodules in their body that store the element. Nodules they can use later in life to create the amazing magical effects you see everywhere by using the electrical currents from their brain. What I want to talk about today, however, are weapons, or more specifically, weapons of mass destruction in the world of Mass Effect. See, the game doesn't tell you really, but there are rules that restrict what kind of weapon is allowed for a government or race to possess and use against certain other planets. These rules are classified into four tiers. Tier 1 being considered the greatest threat to galactic peace. Let's go through them real quick. Tier 4 weapons are those that deliberately introduce alien species into a planet with the sole purpose of destroying the health of an ecosystem. This might be difficult to visualize, so imagine if an alien species came about and purposefully planted treasure maw eggs on the moon or on Mars, eggs that typically take thousands of years to hatch. The nature of how long it takes for them to hatch and how hard they are to spot means that some terrorist race out there could threaten Earth and unleash these eggs on the planet without us really knowing. Now tier 3 weapons are large energy burst weapons, such as nuclear strikes or antimatter warheads. Pretty straightforward, but it gets worse from here on out. Tier 2 weapons are uncontrolled, self-replicating weapons, such as nanotechnology, viral or bacteriological organisms, destructive computer viruses, or self-replicating robots. And lastly, tier 1 weapons which are considered the most dangerous in the galaxy are those that are called large kinetic impactors. A crude example of a large kinetic impactor would be dropping an asteroid onto a planet or deorbiting a space station so that it falls on a planet. It might sound off at first, putting this ahead of some kind of self-replicating virus like the genophage or ahead of self-replicating robots like the Geth, to things that are real consequences of war in Mass Effect that have had tremendous impact. Such tremendous impact that they are both basically permanent problems for the rest of time in this galaxy. So how could dropping a space station onto a planet be more dangerous to galactic peace than those things? Well, see, as far as the Council races are concerned, and as far as humans are concerned, losing your homeworld basically means losing it all. See, the humans of Mass Effect can have as many colonies as they want, but if Earth dies, 
then the human race, for all intents and purposes, is done for. And that is inherently the dangers of large kinetic impactors. Dropping a big asteroid on a planet is actually kind of easy in this universe. Trivial, actually. And all you need is the big one, and the planet is dead. The amount of dust that a decently sized asteroid would create would be enough to doom the planet for a few thousand years by creating a type of nuclear winter. That being having the dust from the impact cloud the sky and prevent the sun from reaching the planet. And this is exactly where I want to go in this video. We talked about mass effect and we talked about large kinetic impactors, but what actually happens when you combine both? What happens is a type of weapon called mass accelerators. The idea of a mass accelerator is the propulsion of a solid metal slug that squashes and shatters on impact, instead of having a bullet that simply goes through the target. This is used in order to increase the damage that the projectile does. The design of the accelerator was revolutionized, like many other things, by the introduction of element zero. The slug can now be accelerated at greater speeds by changing the mass of the object while in flight permitting speeds that were simply unobtainable before. If accelerated to a high enough velocity, a simple paint ship can impact with the same destructive force as a nuclear weapon. Let me go ahead and repeat that. You could use something as small and innocuous as a paint ship and make it hurt as badly as a nuclear weapon thanks to mass accelerators. Yikes. The caveat to this is that mass accelerators produce recoil equal to their impact energy. This is why snipers in this world are still single fire and why you don't see every single soldier carrying a nuke deploying handgun to every fight. The recoils in those weapons would be far too much for a soldier to handle. Now, the actual recoil is mitigated a little by the mass effect fields that the rounds are suspended within, but for the most part, the limiting factor in how powerful you want any specific gun to be is the weapon recoil. Now, you probably already know where I'm going with this. If the only limiting factor in how powerful a gun can be is the recoil, then you could theoretically make a gun that could destroy a planet or even a reaper, as long as you could handle the recoil that comes with that amount of power. A traditional dreadnought, for example, would be about 800 meters long, which equals to about 2600 feet long. The mass accelerator gun that these ships possess typically are the same length of the ship, and one of this caliber would be able to chug a 20 kilogram hunk of metal to a velocity of about 1.3% the speed of light which would create a kinetic energy equal to about two and a half times the energy released by a fission weapon like the one that destroyed Hiroshima during World War II. And the mind-blowing fact is that a typical dreadnought can do this every five seconds. Sir Isaac Newton is the deadliest son of a bitch in space. Now, serviceman Burnside, what is Newton's first law? Sir, an object in motion stays in motion, sir. No credit for partial answers, maggot. Sir, unless acted on by an outside force, sir. Damn straight! I dare to assume you ignorant jackasses know that space is empty. Once you fire this hunk of metal, it keeps going till it hits something. That can be a ship, or the planet behind that ship. It might go off into deep space and hit somebody else in 10,000 years. If you pull the trigger on this, you are ruining someone's day, somewhere and sometime. That is why you check your damn targets, that is why you wait for the computer to give you a damn firing solution. That is why, serviceman Chung, we do not eyeball it. This is a weapon of mass destruction. You are not a cowboy shooting from the hip. Sir, yes sir. Theoretically speaking, as long as a dreadnought has the targeting parameters of a planet, it could shoot these accelerated hunks of metal through space from the other side of the galaxy and have them land on a planet on the other side and completely destroy it. They can shoot a bullet 2.0 times stronger than a fission bomb every 5 seconds and have that bullet travel through space until it reaches its end. And what could really stop it? If you had the ability to see the bullet coming, then you could probably prop something in front of it, but if you lack the technology of being able to see something going this fast, then your planet is doomed. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why kinetic impactors are the number one greatest threat to galactic peace, even above creating robots that build other robots, or even something as powerful as a genophage type of genetic modification. 
This is also why the Treaty of Farrickson exists, a treaty that prevents the overproduction of dreadnoughts that any race can own. They are just far too powerful. I would like to mention that these stats are based on the smallest dreadnoughts, those that are 800 meters long. The flagship of the Citadel fleet is about four times bigger than the biggest dreadnought that humans have. I do not know what the math is on a ship of this size, but I wouldn't be surprised if a single shot from it would be able to create a nuclear winter on a garden planet easily. But what is the part the game doesn't tell you? If the only limiting factor is the recoil, then honestly, why stop at a dreadnought? Why not simply make a Death Star style of gun? Maybe build it on a planet, or on an actual space station. If the Reapers were always a threat to every single living race in this galaxy, then you would think that at least one race would think to make a super gun, wouldn't they? Well, the answer is, they actually did. One race at least. 37 million years ago as to the timeline of when you play in Mass Effect. A race is believed to have created one such super gun. Now, we don't actually have many details on this, but you can find this planet in as early as Mass Effect 1. The planet is Clendagon, and it has a very striking feature. What we call the Great Rift Valley that stretches across the Southern Hemisphere. Now, keep in mind that Clendagon is just about the size of Earth, so you can get a good idea of how big this actually is. What you're seeing here is not the result of an impact of a supermass accelerator gun, but a glancing blow of a mass accelerator gun. The bullet didn't even directly strike the planet. It just sort of passed and struck a little bit off to the side. And to make matters worse, this wasn't even the first thing that bullet hit. In fact, the derelict Reaper in Mass Effect 2 was the first target of this incredible super weapon. The only instance we have seen of a Reaper actually being one-shotted. This bullet went through the Reaper, virtually destroyed it, and then the bullet went on to glance at Clendagon, creating this incredible rift. This is not even the epitome of what can be accomplished with this technology, but merely just as far as this race got. Imagine the possibilities. Oh my god. I would like to thank Alex Fitchie, Toby Oliver, and Dylan Baker for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then head on over to patreon.com slash Thank you so much for your support, and have a good day.